Now, for their whole entire life, the cave is complete darkness apart from a small fire which illuminates the cave somewhat. As these individuals, as these six boys and girls grow, they become six men and women. Their only perception of reality is the fire causing shadows to dance across the wall of the cave. As they see these images move, they assume that this is 100% reality, this is the only reality that they have experienced, and therefore this is the only reality that exists. Until one of the six breaks free from his chains in that cave. He wanders the cave and he sees light in the distance. He follows the light and he exits the cave to see all of the wonders of the world, the greens and the blues and the yellow, all the trees and the flowers and the animals. He rushes back to the cave to tell the others what he has seen. You must break free, he says. You must come out of the cave to see reality. But the others stay. They don't believe him and they are too preoccupied with the shadows on the wall. They are destined to their naivety. You can go to the next slide, please. And one after. Now, these are features of potentially your cave. These are the images on the walls which might be bouncing across your cave. Whenever you think of Africa, you might think of a child with flies on their face. Whenever you think of a big black man, you might assume that he's going to be somewhat related to gang crime. Whenever you hear of uh, black women, you, or whenever, or most of the time when you see black women, they might be flaunting their uh, so-called assets. And whenever you see black people on the news, a lot of the time you might be drawn to this idea of them being criminal, somewhat. So the truth is that we all, from time to time, see the shadows as reality without giving a care to what true reality is, i.e. are these images that we see actually representative of reality? The fire in the cave has now become our news channels, our mobile phones, our social media outlets. So what are the shadows which you may have seen and accepted as your reality, sometimes without even knowing it? Sometimes you might be drawn to action or drawn to a belief and you don't know why, but subconsciously something else is going on in the background. But once we do understand these misconceptions or these, uh, mis this misconstrued reality or these, once again, metaphorically, uh, metaphorical shadows bouncing off the side of the cave, we can start to understand why these might exist. Uh, next slide, please. So, the solution that I ask to you is how do you step outside the cave? How do you get a grasp of what reality is? How many of you have spent time with a large variety of black people, Muslims, members of the LGBTQ community? And how many of you, if so, have questioned, become curious of their culture and their views? Or have you assumed everything before you've actually questioned? The issue is that by not stepping outside of the cave, we can only rely on our assumptions. Statistically, these assumptions lead to poor outcomes for both parties. If I assume who you are before I've actually give, given a chance to question you, then there's no way that I can utilise all that you can provide me with in the world. But on the other side of the coin, for those whose assumptions are made, we have the following statistics. Black people are seven times more likely to be stopped and searched. Black women are five times more likely to die during pregnancy, childbirth, post-birth. African Americans are half as likely to be prescribed pain medication. Black British are paid 7.7% for the same work. Black children are 2.6 times more likely to be excluded from school for the exact same behaviour. Black children are often underassessed in school bias results in their intelligence being underestimated when compared to children who produce the same quality of work, i.e. if you're black and you produce the same quality of work, you're likely to be given a lower grade. Black and Muslim individuals um, need to send up to twice as many job applications to receive the same number of recalls for an interview. Black people are paid 17% less for the same level of education as their white counterparts. Now, let's just summarise these. So we've got black people are seven times more likely to be stopped and searched, i.e. black people, these are the underlying narratives, black people are dangerous. Black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth, uh, pregnancy and postbirth, i.e. black people are tougher. African Americans are half as likely to be prescribed pain medication, black people are tougher. Black British are paid, so 17% so less for the same work, black people are less productive and more stupid. 
Black children are 2.6 times more likely to be excluded than black people in Norway. Black children are under-assessed, once again black people are stupid. Black and Muslim individuals need to send twice as many job applications, once again black people are stupid and unproductive. Black people pay 17% less, once again black people are unproductive and stupid. These are the underlying narratives that are playing here to dictate these statistics. The assumptions that we are dangerous, dispensable, tougher, stupider, or even further, that we have only ever been slaves, so no wonder that we're dangerous and dispensable, tougher, and, stupid, and more stupid. The issue is that this notion is never questioned, or that the evidence uh, to suggest otherwise is never raised. The truth is that we could, we, the truth could not be any more different to which the statistics portray. But because of how British history is portrayed, no alternate dialogue is provided. I want to tell you the story of my people, my family, my lineage, and I hope that this might serve to lead people out of their cave, to prevent them from having to rely on their assumptions that, and these shadows bouncing off the wall of the cave. The true story of black history, or well, let's go for black history in the last, say, 1500 years, is the story of the collision of international powers with great might. Next slide, please. Now, the story starts just after the death of the last prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Shortly after the last prophet of Islam, Muhammad, Europe was deep in the Dark Ages after the collapse of the Roman Empire. Now, a, uh, a writer, Robert Refault, a keen student of development of culture, wrote the following commentary on this period of history in Europe. Europe lay sunk in a night of barbarism, more awful and horrible than that of the primitive savage. For it was a decomposing body of what had been a great civilization, i.e. Romans. Cities had practically disappeared. The remains of the population were dwelling huts, built among the ruins of the amphitheater. Famines and plagues were chronic. Cases of cannibalism were not uncommon. There were manhunts with a view not to plunder, but for food. It is on record that tallness of some human flesh was publicly put up for sale. This is in Europe at the time of the Dark Ages. It would be the equivalent of 95 plus percent of British people being illiterate and Parliament collapsing. Not many of us know how to make a light bulb, not many of us know how to build houses, not many of us know how to hunt and search for food or grow food. Therefore you have a complete collapse of order and what erupts from that is chaos. But the thing is that the Dark Ages were only Eurocentric. In the Middle East, 6th century AD, Muhammad founded the religion of Islam and instructed his followers to seek knowledge. Islam then quickly spread across North Africa by trade and by conquest. As these Muslims travelled and conquered, they became known as the Moors. The Moors, thirst for knowledge, led them to the great library of Alexandria. In Alexandria, they were able to acquire the Greek classics and the Roman classics. The Moors then invaded Spain. A man called Tariq led the invasion. He settled in, or he invaded in Gibraltar, which is why we now have Gibraltar, which means Rock of Tariq. The Muslims then took this education that accumulated and civilization that they had grown and then influxed into Europe and spread their civilization into southern Spain. They then conquered a place called Toledo, which is what we know as the start of the European Renaissance, which is where the Europeans were able to take this knowledge and, and to use it and spread it across Europe to provide a more sophisticated civilization. This is after 800 years of the Dark Ages. So ironically, many historians would argue that what pulled Europe out of the Dark Ages was African and Arabic Muslims. Christopher Columbus, the Italian explorer who traveled to America to claim it for European forces was a direct result of this era of history. Next slide, please. Now, shortly before this period, we have uh, West Africa, where my dad's family descend from. At this point in time, West Africa was the richest place on the planet. Max Moussa, who I think you've heard of before, was the king of Mali at the time. He's still the richest man that's ever lived. He was so rich that when he took Hajj, which is the, um, the Muslim pil pilgrimage to Mecca, 
He spent so much gold on his way in Egypt that he crashed their gold economy and it didn't recover for decades after. Mali was also the centre for education, international education, with more people being educated in Timbuktu in Mali than the entire population of London at the time. People from all over Europe, Africa and Asia travelled to Timbuktu to receive education. West Africa was a source of knowledge of astronomy, advanced mathematics and science, however its collapse was near. Next slide please. In 1600, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, daughter of Henry VIII, was the, fir uh, the first of England, allied with the Moroccan forces and waged war against West Africa to sack West Africa for all it had. They took war, or they made war with the Somai. They extracted huge quantities of gold and sacked their great cities to give them a major advantage. And the reason why they were able to do this is because they had guns. Guns are a common feature in the early stages of the British Empire, especially in the British Raj and the colonisation of West Africa. Because they had guns, they had a huge advantage when it came to, or well, I suppose, leveraging these to uh, a great threat of the people who lived there. Uh, next slide, please. We then have the land grab of America. Shortly after Britain, Spain, and France, um, shortly after was it, uh, let's not use the word discovered, shortly after Christopher Columbus travelled to America. Britain, Spain and France went on a land grab, especially, especially motivated, motivated by the feudal system which we had in England, which was that the more land you own, the richer you are, which is where we get our lords and our barons and, and things like that, right? So a lot of the British then went over to America to grab as much land as possible, taking the land by force. They genocided approximately 55 million Native Americans, and this was by the spread of foreign diseases and by use of warfare. They enslaved many of them, remaining Native Americans, but needed more labour to work the plantations which produced addictive substances such as tobacco, coffee, rum and sugar, etc. And to do so, they once again turned to West Africa. I have seen documents at the time, there was some outcry from the European public, or let's say from the British public, who were sick of hearing or disgusted by hearing that the Native Americans had been genocided by so much. They then appealed to the Pope, or I think it was the Spanish who appealed to the Pope. The Pope then replied, take the Africans, for they have no souls. And bring on to the next slide, please. Sucked from previous European invasion, West Africa was vulnerable. The British and the European forces incited violence on the continent by exchanging guns for slaves. Essentially, they created an arms race. They targeted enemy tribes, antagonised tribes, and traded guns on each side for the exchange of prisoners of war from the aftermath of this tribal warfare. It was either this or raid coastal towns themselves or kidnap Africans to take as slaves to the Americas. When I say the Americas, I mean uh, uh, North America, South America and the Caribbean as well. The average age of the Africans taken was 15 years old. Most wouldn't, wouldn't survive, well a lot, about a third of them wouldn't survive the journey over and after that on average, they lived from five to nine years after they got there because they were worked to death. Next slide, please. Then comes the 400 years of slavery. The conditions of slavery were so barbaric that one third of all Africans died on the crossing. Up to 20 million Africans landed in the Americas over this period, which means that six to ten of Africans died on the way over. A lot of the time, this would be down to them being so, if I demonstrate, um, They'd be, there'd be a wooden floor on the slave ships. The slave ships would be transporting these Africans for 30 to 90 days. It would take a month to three months for them to get from West Africa to America. Now, at that time, they were either laid flat on their back and chained down, or they were chained in a forced flexed over position with their hands chained to their feet for three months. The only time that they would have a break is when the owners of the slave ship would take them up to the surface and would make them dance. That's where we get the dance, uh, is it called Limbo? Where you have to go under the, have you seen Limbo? You have to go under the thing? Have you seen that? Yeah, you seen it? That comes from practicing on the slave ships. That's what they would do to mobilize the slaves and increase their mobility. Their name was taken from them and replaced with a Christian name. These names are still in use today. For example, my last name is Reed. Reed is not an ethnically West African name. It's the name that was given to my ancestors uh, by, the, by their slave owner. And if you meet uh, a black person with a European last name, it's most likely that is the name that they inherited 
from the last slave owner that owned their family. So if you think of five or ten different black celebrities, a lot of them will have European last names. It's because that name was given to them by, or that, that's the name that was given to uh, their ancestors by the slave owner who owned them. My family was taken to Jamaica from West Africa. They would have worked over 12 hours a day cutting sugarcane and harvesting tobacco. The average life expectancy was seven to nine years after arrival on the island. They were whipped and they were force fed. They were raped and they were tortured. But for 400 years, they did not stop fighting. And it's very important that you remember this. For some reason, there is obsession with talking about uh, William Wilberforce and Abraham Lincoln as the liberator of slaves. That is not the case. Most of the effort for the abolition of slavery came from the Africans who were enslaved. Just as much as you all, if you were taken beyond your rights, and you were taken beyond your agreements, you would most likely struggle against your oppressor. And that is exactly the same thing that happened. However, hope came in the 19th century. Next slide, please. In France, at this time, there were screams of liberty, equality, and fraternity during the French Revolution. Now, the, the news of this French Revolution travelled from all the way from Europe over to the Caribbean. The French, um, French Revolution was the overthrow of the monarchy by the oppressed, poor French people. And they wanted to claim rights for all people, the poor and the rich. Now, before, even before the revolution, the French Revolution has, has ended, Toussaint Louverture, a freed slave on the island of Haiti, was in company of a voodoo uh, ceremony. Voodoo is a religious practice that was taken from West Africa to the Caribbean. The voodoo priestess spoke of a messiah who was going to rise up from the Africans on the island and fight off the oppressive French. Toussaint Louverture then grew to become a general in the French Revolution. He led the enslaved Africans on the island in Haiti to victory as he overthrew the French slave owners after defeating the French, the Spanish, the British and Napoleon Bonaparte's own army and instated a black-run democracy on the island of Haiti. This is the only time in history where an enslaved population has overthrown their oppressor and set up a democracy in its place. The man on the left-hand side there, you'll see his two set literature. The one in the middle is two set literature and the one on the right is his right-hand man, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Uh, next slide, please. This set a domino effect across the islands of the Caribbean. Within 30 years, the other states of the Caribbean were falling like dominoes. Emancipation was spreading. My family fought under Sam Sharp as he led 60,000 Africans against the British for freedom. This is in 1831 to 1832. They burned plantations and killed slave owners. A year later, slavery was abolished on the island of Jamaica. The enslaved Africans were free for the first time in 400 years. Next slide, please. So now we have today, 20th to 21st century. Just over 100 years later, my family travelled from Jamaica to England. Shortly before that, 3.2 million members of the Commonwealth, i.e. Africa and India and the Caribbean, volunteered to help England fight the Nazis in World War II. After World War II, the UK needed copious amounts of help and labour to help to regenerate the country. Before my family had even docked in Tilbury, Essex, during Windrush, as they came over, there were already petitions, even before they docked, there were already petitions, petitions by English people to send them back to where they came from. There were conservative campaigns in the north of England with the slogan, if you want a nigger for a neighbour, vote Labour. Thirteen black children were burnt to death by an arsonist in East, in East London. In 1981. In 1993, Stephen Lawrence was killed by four men as they stabbed him with a five inch blade, as they called him a nigger, over and over and over again in 1993. And there are countless more examples of racialized violence since and before. And yes, without a doubt, things have improved. But still, statistics show that we are considered stupider, tougher, and more primitive, despite this being completely untruthful. Why is this? I would argue that it's because the shadows that are dancing off the cave of people's perceptions are the same shadows and the same misconceptions that were used to gain English and British support to enslave a people for over 400 years. 
It's the same ignorance that caused a group of boys to drag me out of the party when I was 13, 14, to give me a kick in. It's the same ignorance that caused, caused another guy to try and drag me out of the party, give me a kick in when I was 17, 18. It's the same reason why, while sitting on a plane when I was 16, 17, on the way back from Spain, on the way back from holiday, I was sitting next to my Nigerian friend. And I was sitting next to a, a lovely English woman, and her husband leant over and he instructed her to swap places with him. And she said, why am I having a lovely discussion with these two young men? And he said, I'm just trying to protect you. It's the same reason why I have had patients who have said to me that I really, or my lot, really shouldn't be here. It's the same reason why I've had a patient who was under my care tell me that I was an anomaly. I was the one out because, because I was hard-working, well-educated, and black. These individuals are using the same shadows that were dancing off the walls for 400 years to instruct their own assumptions on who I am before they've had a chance to meet me. And this is all because, unfortunately, there are still some individuals who have not taken the time and have not taken the effort to step outside of Plato's cave and step into the real world. And I would like to pose a question to you as to what is the solution to this. Thank you.